So you will have just gotten a message to let you all know that the recording is now in process. And go ahead to the next slide, please. As we get started tonight, uh, we would invite you all to take a plea to take a moment uh, to rename yourself and with your first name as well as your neighborhood. And this again, optional. And how you do that is you click on participants. So you see the participant bar on the right of your screen, hover over your name, click more, and then select rename. And you would put your first name and your neighborhood. So we'll give you all a moment to do that. Your first name and your neighborhood, the neighborhood that you're representing tonight. And then we'd also in the chat invite you all to share one highlight from your summer. So one highlight from your summer. And you'll see the prompt in the chat as well. What was the highlight of your summer or one highlight? There could have been many. And please put that in the chat. What was the highlight of your summer or one highlight from your summer? Looking for a response in the chat. A new grandbaby, that's very exciting from Judy. Nicole, the success of my edible garden from Janelle. Hiking, so hiking Twin Falls with seven kids and two adults, that's no small undertaking. From Todd, day hikes in the Cascades. From Anne, swimming in Echo Lake. Maya, a trip. Janelle, a visit to Santa Fe, New Mexico for my daughter's wedding. From Carolyn, backpacking along the Olympic coast. From Ginger, visiting family. Lots of great highlights here. And as more highlights come to you, feel free to share them in the chat. We have from David meeting friends in California that haven't seen in five years. Keep those highlights coming. And now we're gonna uh, ask you all, uh, recognizing that this is the final of five community climate conversations, and know that some of you may have been here for the very first one. Some of you may have come to one or two, and we'd love to see how many of these you've been to. So our first one was in December of 2021, which may seem like a, a lifetime ago for, for some of us. Then we had three in March of 2022. And so this is our fifth of five. So using the Zoom raise hand icon, which you should see if you hover at the bottom of your screen, please raise your hand if this is your first or second time coming to a community climate conversation. This is your first or second community climate conversation that you've been to. Excellent, see a couple of hands. And please raise your hand if you've been to three or four climate conversations. Several of you raising your hands. Excellent. And for those that are just joining us for the very first one, we welcome you. For those that have come to more of these, we are excited to have you back and to have been on this journey with you all uh, at various different stages of these climate conversations. So welcome to everybody. We're so excited to have you all here tonight. With that, we can go to the next slide, which is the workshop overview. So what are our purposes of tonight? We've got four main purposes. So we'll be introducing key elements of the draft climate action plan. So that's the cap and associated priority actions. So this process has developed a draft plan which is now online and available for public comment. And we'll be sharing some of those key elements of that draft plan with you all tonight. Reviewing the draft cap uh, with the community. So again, uh, I'll be turning it over to Cameron in just a moment from the city of Shoreline who will be walking through those key elements generating interest in and gathering ideas about implementation. So really looking at this plan as actionable, as implementable, and you all as being key partners in that implementation. Introducing the draft cap and public comment platform. So Conveo is a website that will that is where the, this plan is now living and very user-friendly and is the platform for providing public comment. So how are we gonna get there? 
Uh, we've done welcome and introductions, and we'll be diving into the context setting, draft cap introduction, those high priority actions, and Cameron will be speaking to all three of those agenda elements. Then we'll be opening it up for smaller group conversations via the breakout rooms, and then we'll come back together as a full group, wrap up, and adjourn. Let's go to the next slide, please. So you'll be hearing a lot of information from Cameron in just a couple moments here. And please, at any moment uh, that you have a question, clarifying question, reflection that you'd like to share with the group, feel free to add it in the chat throughout the course of this presentation. We do have a designated Q&A time period to address questions. And so we'll be doing, we'll be taking a look at the chat, seeing what questions have come through during the presentation and then answering those during the, during the Q&A period. And if you're calling in on the phone and would like to ask a question, please press star nine to raise your hand once you reach the Q&A section of this meeting. So for those that are joining via phone, we'll have that option of raising their hand and sharing their question, comment, reflection verbally. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Cameron for the Shoreline Climate Action Plan overview of the planning process so far. Awesome. Thank you, Gretchen. Uh, it's good to see you all. Thanks so much for coming here. It's good to see some familiar names and faces, uh, as well as some new ones. Um, so I'm Cameron Reed, your uh, Environmental Services Program Manager, um, who has been uh, leading the Climate Action Plan update. And so I know a lot of you have been along um, helping us over the course of this past year, working on the CAP. But for those who are new, I just wanted to provide a quick recap um, what is the Climate Action Plan? Why are we doing it? Um, so you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, and driven by strong community interest in environmental sustainability over the years, uh, the city of Shoreline has been working to address climate change and reduce emissions uh, for some time. We completed our first Climate Action Plan as a city back in 2013 and have completed many of the actions and the recommendations from that plan. Um, and so greenhouse gas emissions that are driving climate change uh, in shoreline come primarily from driving gasoline and diesel vehicles and from burning natural gas or heating oil uh, to heat our homes and buildings. And we've been measuring community-wide emissions since 2009 to track our progress in reducing uh, these uh, greenhouse gases. And you can see the results of these emissions inventories in the graph here. And as you can see, uh, community-wide emissions from shoreline have decreased about 5% since 2009, despite a growing population. So while this is some good progress, we need to significantly reduce emissions uh, much more quickly if we are to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of climate change. Uh, so you can see the orange dots um, and the blue uh, solid colored area there at the 2030 and 2050 mark are our updated uh, emissions reduction targets that the council committed to um, back in 2021. And these targets reflect the level of emissions reductions we need uh, to achieve to limit global warming to the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold um, in line with the Paris Climate Agreement. So um, you can see sort of the trend line there in the, the dotted orange. Um, so yeah, we need to significantly reduce emissions much more quickly than we have been over the coming decades um, if we want to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And uh, these targets just call for a 60% reduction of community-wide emissions by 2030 uh, and achieving net zero emissions where any continued emissions are balanced out by activities and processes that capture carbon by 2050. Uh, next slide, please. So that brings us to the Climate Action Plan, um, updating the, the plan that was first created in 2013. Uh, it's going to focus on key actions that the city can take to uh, achieve three things. And the first, obviously, is to reduce the emissions that are driving climate change to meet those 2030 and 2050 targets. However, we know that climate change is already here. It's already impacting shoreline and communities around the world, um, you know, with things in our region, such as hotter summer 
temperatures, uh, increasing wildfire risk, and uh, winter flooding. So the Climate Action Plan will also include actions to make sure our community is protected from these and other impacts. Lastly, the plan will include actions to protect and enhance healthy, functioning ecosystems for the many benefits they provide, including their ability to capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And so just reiterating that the, the plan really is focused on uh, actions that the city can take, policies or programs to address climate change, um, recognizing that individual action is very important and necessary, um, but that the focus of this plan is really on what we can do as, as the city. And just wanted to highlight as well that, um, you know, taking action to address climate change has many uh, additional benefits for our community, including uh, protecting and enhancing public health and quality of life, um, protecting ecosystem health, uh, achieving cleaner air and water from reduced pollution, and providing cost savings for residents from lower utility and energy costs. Next slide, please. And I'll uh, turn it back over to Gretchen here. Thanks very much, Cameron. So for some of you who have been at other climate conversations, this project timeline will look very familiar to you. For those that are joining us for the first time, uh, wanting to do a quick walkthrough of our overall project timeline, you'll see that we started in the spring of 2021. We've had three phases of the project. That first one, that first phase around building awareness and understanding priorities. And we obtained early uh, public feedback from that first climate conversation uh, back in December, then moved into phase two, where we collaboratively developed strategies based on community feedback and feedback from other city representatives, as well as hosted a series of three community climate conversations it was in March timeframe. And now we're in phase three, which is obtaining public feedback uh, via this conversation, as well as the release of the draft of the draft climate action plan. And so that's up live right now, uh, available for public comment and look forward to you all heading over there either after this meeting or in the upcoming days to provide additional comment to that draft climate action plan. So we are at the rounding the end of our project here and phase three. And you'll see that we've had several touch points with the community, this being our fifth of five climate conversations. And go ahead to the next slide, please. So what has engagement looked like over the, the past few months here and various phases through phase one, phase two, phase three of this project? We've had four community climate conversations to date. We've had two surveys that helped us refine and shape key core elements of the climate action plan. So the action list, the criteria for the action evaluation. So how did we prioritize actions? We have a very long, robust list of actions. So which ones rose to the top? You all helped us and the community helped us identify those criteria for action evaluation and which resulted in action prioritization. And go ahead to the next slide, please. So work since March. So what has the project team been doing? So they conducted what is called a multi-criteria multi analysis or MCA. And Cameron will dive more deeply into the multi-criteria analysis and the results of that in just a few moments. We also conducted a cost assessment. We did a wedge analysis as well. We refined and finalized the plan's action list, and we drafted the cap. And as we mentioned, the cap is up online right now and is available, and we're excited for additional public comment on that draft cap. And with that, I will turn it over to Cameron to dive more deeply into the draft plan and what's there. Awesome. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, very excited to present this draft climate action plan, which reflects the work and input of many different staff um, and community members, including many of you over this past year. Um, however, it's uh, too long to present the whole thing uh, or walk through it in detail here tonight. So I wanna just spend a couple minutes um, to highlight some key pieces before we move into our breakout group discussions, 
where you will have more of an opportunity to, to provide some feedback and, and chew on some of the pieces. Um, next slide, please. Oh, and Haley just put uh, a link into the chat. So that is where the draft climate action plan is published. And I'll do a little preview of that site um, where you can go in and actually just put comments directly on the pages uh, of the climate action plan. So the first piece to highlight here is uh, called the wedge analysis, which is a model to forecast future emissions uh, through 2050, as well as a pathway um, for how we can meet our, our emissions reduction targets that I shared earlier. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, we've seen a 5% decrease in our community-wide emissions since 2009, which is not on track to meet our targets. Additionally, population is growing significantly in the Puget Sound region, uh, including in shoreline. And so the black line at the top of this graph shows how emissions uh, would increase through 2050 with population growth if we collectively do nothing. So this is sort of a business as usual scenario. And so you can see um, you know, emissions grow with population growth through that time frame. Uh, however, there has been significant action uh, taken at both the state and federal level to reduce emissions um, policies and programs that have already been put in place. And we've taken several bold steps here in Shoreline to reduce emissions. Um, and from all of these actions, we can expect uh, some, some fairly significant emissions reductions uh, from these existing policies. So those are shown in the gray and the sort of navy blue bands there. So those are policies and programs that are already in place and our projection of how much emissions we think they will reduce. And uh, not going through everything, um, but this includes policies like Washington state and federal clean fuel standards that increase vehicle fuel economy and the fossil fuel ban that we passed here in Shoreline last year, um, becoming one of the first cities in Washington to do so, um, to remove uh, fossil fuels from new large buildings. We've also taken uh, the bold action of rezoning the areas around the future light rail stations to support dense development within walking distance to business and transit. Um, and so that is also reflected in the blue bands there, uh, which is expected to significantly reduce emissions um, from those residents. Uh, however, everything below that blue line in the green is emissions we still would need to reduce to reach our targets. So this is um, a significant challenge, and uh, these reductions in this model uh, occur primarily in three areas. So one is to continue to reduce overall driving in our community. Uh, second, is to support a rapid and equitable transition to electric vehicles um, running on, uh, drawing from our electricity grid here that we have access to from Seattle City Light, which is uh, provides carbon-free electricity, um, which is a big benefit we have in Shoreline. And uh, lastly, one of the biggest areas where we can reduce emissions, so this is the largest green band there on the graph, is in our existing building stock. Um, and so this will mean supporting residents and other building owners uh, to actually convert from fossil fuel based heating systems, such as gas or oil furnaces, to efficient electric uh, heat pump systems. Uh, next slide, please. And so the next piece, uh, you know, obviously there are many, many actions uh, that we can take as a city, and there's a lot in the included here in the climate action plan. So we wanted to prioritize those that would be most feasible and effective, and that align most with uh, community priorities. So your feedback over the past year through the different channels that Gretchen mentioned helped shape these criteria um, and the rankings there. So you can see these are the criteria we use to prioritize a subset of the actions um, and the weightings. And you can find the full results of this uh, prioritization analysis on pages 55 through 57 of the draft climate action plan if you want to see it um, all kind of laid out graphically. 
Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, since we don't have time to go through all of the actions, I just want to highlight uh, three of the top actions that rose to the top from this prioritization in each focus area. So this first focus area, um, there's five, and the first one is transportation and mobility. And so uh, these are the three that rose to the top. So we can see continuing to support increased density and walkability, um, supporting transit-oriented development, and reducing business trips from employees. Next slide, please. Uh, and in the buildings and energy, Focus area, these are the top actions. So providing a program to help electrify homes and a program to support electrification of larger commercial and multifamily buildings. Um, and then working, continuing to work uh, to encourage new homes that are built to be all electric. Next slide, please. Uh, in the waste, uh, zero waste focus area, um, we have access to lots of composting and recycling services, uh, but the next step there would be to actually require food waste uh, to be composted and require certain recyclables to be uh, not placed in the garbage. Um, continuing to provide community programs to reduce the amount of waste that's generated in the first place and working to reduce uh, single use plastic food service wear from uh, food service establishments. Next slide, please. In our ecosystems and sequestration focus area, these are the three actions. So developing a program to provide trees for planting out on a private property in the city, increasing tree protection requirements during development, and expanding our street tree planting efforts. Next slide, please. And lastly, uh, in our community resilience and preparedness focus area, we want to make sure that the emergency preparedness resources and planning efforts we do here at the city are uh, providing adequate resources for the climate impacts that we will be seeing, um, and then providing incentives for uh, retrofits on private property that can increase resilience, and then looking at design practices uh, for both city projects and private development that can uh, mitigate or reduce urban heat impacts. Next slide, please. So that was a lot of information, uh, sort of a, a world a lightning tour here. Um, and at this time, I will turn it back over to Gretchen to uh, do our Q&A. Excellent. Thank you so much. And just scrolling through the chat, thank you, everybody, for, for adding your questions in here. And we will start from the beginning. So the first question uh, from Janet is, how is the city able to accurately measure these claimed emission reductions? And what data is this based on? Do you actually measure emissions in the air? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there are uh, established methodologies for doing these emissions inventories. So um, my one of my previous staff members at the city completed our emissions inventory um, earlier in 2021 using data from 2019. It's a very extensive process that involves, um, you know, working with a lot of utilities, just gathering a ton of different data, um, largely about, you know, fuel usage in buildings, electricity usage, uh, wastewater, solid waste generation, a whole bunch of different data sources, uh, driving data sets, um, and then using, yeah, some established methodologies. So yeah, it's not, we're not going out and measuring uh, gas particles in the air, but we're using, you know, real world data um, from a bunch of different sources to uh, come up with a, you know, a, a pretty good picture of the emissions that we're directly causing here in Shoreline. So there's a, a pretty extensive, um, report right up about that process. Um, that is one of the appendices in the climate action plan. So if you're interested, um, check that out and definitely feel free to send me, you know, if you have specific questions, um, it, it's a little bit technical, but um, yeah, please, please reach out with more questions about that. Thanks, Cameron. Next question is, how are vehicle emissions to lower with all the development along Aurora, which is bringing hundreds more cars? 
Um, yeah, that's a that's a great question. So um, transitioning to uh, a denser urban environment where there's more amenities uh, within walking distance and there people have access to better transit systems has is proven again and again in a bunch of different literature to be the most uh, one of the most effective things that cities can do in the especially in the US where we have more auto dependent communities thinking about a um, you know a place like shoreline that was kind of developed as an auto dependent suburb. Um, so making that transition is definitely challenging. There's a, you know, a ton of issues to hash out as that happens, but that is one of, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of data about um, that being one of the most uh, effective ways to reduce emissions in the long term. And we have a question here, Cameron, about capturing carbon emissions and the issue with huge trees being lost around the city. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and this is the flip side of supporting that density that reduces the direct emissions is that you lose some, you know, if you're going from a single family lot, as you all are, you know, very well aware, converting to an apartment building, um, that's a drastic change in land use. And um, definitely, if you're looking at that specific parcel, um, you know, you could argue that the sequestration ability is less. But if you look at sort of the landscape set scale and a regional scale where we're by supporting density with access to transit, we're preventing sprawl out in the hinterlands. Um, you know, there's a lot of gains to be had actually on a regional level from sequestration. The next question here is, are the figures that were presented as our greenhouse gas emissions acquired by calculations or by actual measurement? So it was the methodology there. Yeah, I think, I think that was sort of addressed, um, but again, take a look at the report for the emissions inventory. And um, yeah, it uses uh, standard protocols to, to take um, utility data sets and different data sets and convert that to emissions. This next one, with electrification such as a key part of the solution, does the city have any incentives for home building owners? That's a great question. And um, yeah, a lot of, there's a, several actions in the climate action plan about that. There's also um, the Inflation Reduction Act that was just passed um, at the federal level, uh, really targets a ton of resources and incentives for homeowners um, specific to, yeah, electrification. Next question here. Um, lots of great questions in here. We may not be able to get to everything during our Q&A period, but we will capture it and we will provide a, a response uh, post meeting too, if we're not able to get to all these good questions. Next one is, does the planning arm of the city have any influence over implementing the procedures to achieve the goals? Uh, that's a great question as well. Yeah, so the CAP is a um, interdepartmental effort. Excuse me. Um, so a lot of these actions um, and hashing out the specific policies will happen in our public works department in our parks department, in our planning department. Um, so it really is a uh, coordinated effort um, between these departments, um, both to put the climate action plan together and then to actually implement it. Next one here, will Shoreline ban the use of styrofoam containers for food? Uh, so there is actually a ban um, that was passed at the Washington state level that will go into effect um, I believe it's 2024. I can I can look that up to get the exact date. Uh, but we could also, yeah, we could consider doing a ban in advance of that um, if there was interest. Great. And then there was a clarifying question about one of the slides where forest carbon sequestration, I believe it was slide 14, maybe, where there was a reference to no action future. What does that mean? Oh, yeah. Um, so that's the wedge analysis. And I think that was just how it was. Thanks, Haley. Um, so that is referring to the dotted line. The no action future is the business as usual scenario, which is at the top. That's just the legend. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Scrolling through here, give people that haven't had a chance to ask a question a chance here. Next question is, how does the city expect homeowners to afford the transition to electric heat as heat pumps also still require either a gas or electric furnace and the cost of electricity for those changing to that in older homes is expensive? 
Any more you want to add to that? So, yeah, uh, uh, electric heat pump technology has advanced significantly in the past um, decade, and you don't actually require a, a gas furnace in addition to it. Um, but it's a great point that it is uh, very expensive. And so that's uh, something that, you know, we have some actions in the cap about providing resources for building owners and for homeowners to um, make those swaps. And then there are um, the resources I mentioned that are quite significant from the federal government to help uh, folks make that switch as well. Next question here is, would the cap mean that Shoreline would increase funding for stormwater management to decrease flooding during large storm events where unfiltered water runs into lakes, creeks, and the sound? Yeah, that's a that's a great question as well. Um, so our stormwater utility, I, I don't know um, whether this specific res recommendations in the cap would increase uh, stormwater funding, but there definitely are recommendations that will be implemented uh, by our surface water utility um, and that are really in their purview, um, especially, yeah, those, those resources and infrastructure related to flooding. There's also a lot um, that has to do with the capital projects, so how we're building, uh, you know, new roads and storm drains um, and making sure those are sized appropriately for, um, you know, the, the types of storms we are going to see more of in the future. Thanks, Cameron. Just doing a, a final scroll through. We are going to keep moving here. Uh, we've got a couple of questions about rezoning. So how does rezoning alone reduce emissions when the development is achieved by using fossil fuels and massive amounts of concrete and asphalt? So question about rezoning and reduction of emissions, which I know you've hit on a little bit. Is there anything more on that, Cameron, that you'd like to share? Yeah, no, I, I do just want to acknowledge that it is a it's a complex issue and there's a lot of different angles to that. Um, and so, yeah, bringing up the concrete and the actual building materials. So um, that idea of embodied carbon in, in the buildings and how they're being built is also something we absolutely want to look at. Um, and there are a couple actions looking at how we're building those buildings, making sure they're they're, um, you know, as sustainable as they can be. Um, but again, it's it's uh, with so much of our emissions in shoreline coming from driving, um, transitioning to a type of urban environment where that is not as necessary is one of the biggest things we can do to address climate change. Thanks, Cameron. And then we've got a link in here to the food service products, uh, styrofoam being banned in Washington in June of 2024. Thank you for, for sharing that link. Okay, with that, we are going to keep moving here. Thank you for all the great questions. If additional questions come up, even while we're in the breakout rooms, uh, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat. And if we can't answer them tonight, uh, we will be sure to, to follow up and get them answered. So with that, we can go ahead to the next slide, please. So we're doing a quick walkthrough of the breakout room. So this is, you've heard a lot from us and now this is our turn to hear from you all. And so I'm gonna do a quick walkthrough of what the breakout rooms will look like, how they'll be structured, and then what we'll be discussing in those breakout rooms. And we can go ahead to the next slide, please. So we're here, you'll see the little arrow that in just a few moments, we'll be transitioning into breakout rooms and acknowledging that during the registration, the Zoom registration, some of you indicated a preference for a room. We captured that, we put you into that room. Uh, for those that didn't indicate a preference for a particular room, and, and by room, I mean focus area, which I'll be getting to in the next slide here, we put you, we selected a focus area for you if once you get into that room, if that focus area just isn't feeling quite right and you want to dive into another focus area, then you would just head back into the main room and Haley, who will be in the main room, will redirect you into the focus area breakout room discussion that you'd like to be in. So I'm going to do a quick overview of what that discussion will look like, what those rooms will be focusing on, those, those five different focus areas. Then we'll be heading into those rooms. And with a discussion, where we'll be hearing from you all on various elements of the actions and the climate action plan overall. 
Then we'll be coming back after 60 minutes, roughly 60 minutes, we'll be coming back to the main room where we'll get a report out and get to hear some of the highlights and recaps of each of the discussions that happened in the various breakout rooms. And we can go ahead to the next slide, please. So these are those five focus areas and Cameron also walked through these when he was doing an orientation of the core elements of the climate action plan. So all of the actions, all of the strategies and the actions are divided into these five focus areas. So buildings and energy, transportation and mobility, ecosystems and sequestration, community resilience and preparedness, and zero waste. And so we've got five breakout rooms by focus area. So we've got a buildings and energy focus area breakout room, transportation and mobility focus area breakout room, ecosystems and sequestration, community resilience preparedness, and zero waste. And we have a facilitator who will be facilitating the conversation as per the focus area that you will go to. So with that, we can go ahead to the next slide, please. So as I mentioned, each room will cover one focus area and its associated actions. And during the discussion, we've got two main elements of our discussion to talk through with you all. One is an overview of the draft cap and get your re reflections, comments on that. And even if you haven't yet had a chance to take a look at that draft cap, we'll just be asking some, some general questions in the breakout room associated with the core elements of the climate action plan that Cameron walked through during the presentation portion of this evening's discussion. And then the second portion of the questions that we'll be asking you are hearing your feedback specifically on the implementation of actions in one particular focus area. So taking a look at the actions in that particular focus area and having you all help us put legs on this action plan. So what does implementation look like from a community member standpoint? What does it look like from a partner standpoint? And uh, what are some core elements that uh, related to equity? And so we'll be asking each of the questions associated with each of these three areas. And go to the next slide, please. So from the community perspective, your all's perspective, what role do you see for yourself or other community members in implementing these actions? And how can the city help the community implement these actions? Let's go to the next slide, please. From the potential partner standpoint, what role do you see in advancing this action? What role do you see for yourself or other community members in uh, what are, who are some core partners who could help advance this action and what role do you see those core partners playing? And the next is equity considerations. Are there additional equity considerations we should consider when implementing these actions? And we at our community climate conversations that we had back in March, we received a lot of great input around equity considerations. So we'll be bringing those forward for you all to see and then we'll be opening up the conversation. Is there anything missing? Are there any additional equity considerations that you're not seeing here that you wanna be sure that we capture? Next slide, please. And then with that, we will transition. Uh, we're about to transition into breakout rooms. Once we have these conversations over the next hour, we'll then transition back into the main room, get that report out that I mentioned, and then move into a walkthrough of what providing public comment via the Conveo platform will look like. Any questions, anything I missed, project team, on how these breakouts are going to work that you want to be sure that we capture before we head into these breakout rooms? Cameron, Haley, Sarah, anything I missed? I think that's great. Thanks, Gretchen. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our discussions. Okay, excellent. And Haley, let us know, as I mentioned, we have pre-assigned you one of those five focus areas. Some of you did indicate when you registered for this event, which focus area you wanted to focus on. Uh, some of you didn't, so we went ahead and assigned you. If that focus area doesn't seem quite right, feel free to head right back into the main room and we'll get you reassigned. All right, so with that, Haley, just going to give Haley just a moment to get those breakout rooms ready to go, and we will get those conversations started. 
Excellent. Welcome back, everybody. We had great conversations in my room, and I'm excited to hear about the highlights from each of the other focus areas and each of the other breakout room conversations as well. So we're going to do a quick round robin where we'll hear highlights uh, from the discussion and a summary of the conversation. And we'll start with transportation and mobility and highlights from Sarah. Okay, um, so our group is transportation and mobility um, and yeah. We had a great conversation, I feel like. So thank you for those that were in the room. Um, but the main things we talked about, um, we're wanting to include more types of um, electric transportation than just cars. So frequently when we say electric vehicles, um, it's not all vehicles or not all types of vehicles. It's really just cars. So taking into consideration bikes and scooters as well and increasing use of those and not just electric cars. Um, the next big point was um, really thinking about mixed use development and how people move around in the city um, and wanting to really be intentional, intentional about putting the right types of development in the right places. Um, our group agreed that walking should really be the primary goal and it's really the dream for Shoreline. Those are the those are the big items for our group. Excellent. Thanks for sharing, Sarah. Any questions for the transportation and mobility group before we move to the next group? Um, I, I I think that's fabulous about walking. There's nothing I'd rather do than walk. And I wonder if walkable uh, neighborhoods is in cap. I apologize, I didn't read recap yet. But um, if if because our quality of life is so improved when we can walk around our neighborhoods, um, is there any kind of walkability uh, factor in the cap? Yep, that's a great point. And yeah, there is, if you check out the transportation section, it has some, some actions around walkability. Thank you. Now we're gonna hear from Bethany and the zero waste room and zero great. waste this area. Thanks, Bethany. Gretchen. Yeah, we had a really engaging conversation about our the zero waste category. And um, the main things we focused on or kind of our discussion summary is they did feel that the cap is on the right track and are looking forward to diving into the online platform soon or more and uh, really support developing and implementing waste reduction policies and programs uh, in collaboration with the community. And really uh, the group felt that there definitely needs to be regulations, laws, uh, that uh, I, I stopped using the word mandate, but mandate um, changes into our waste systems because um, kind of felt like that we can only incentivize so much and that some of that's just going to have to come through regulations. So um, it was a great conversation and uh, thanks to my group. Excellent. Thanks so much, Bethany. Any questions for her group before we move into the next focus area? Turning it over to Cameron and the ecosystems and sequestration focus area. All right. Uh, and yeah, thanks to my group, we had a full conversation um, and a lot of ideas and, and things that we talked about. So I won't be able to cover it all. Um, but in general, yeah, there was um, recognition and appreciation that for, for some of the emphasis and goals related to uh, tree protection specifically. Um, but there was some concern about uh, follow through and that potentially not having teeth or, um, you know, what that would look like when we come to implementation. Uh, there was also a desire to better articulate um, how conflicting priorities in the cap are navigated. So specifically, you know, supporting increased density and also having goals about increasing tree retention and canopy cover. Um, shifting to think about resources that are needed. Um, a couple folks mentioned the uh, volunteer forest steward program and that there's a lot of great partnership, you know, and resources already provided, but that really um, needs a more wider uh, mobilization. 
um, some potential to partner more with schools. Um, and schools came up uh, for a number of these uh, tree related ones, thinking about you know large land uh, areas where we have uh, the potential to add trees, but also some concerns about you know tree survivability um, for a lot of the school projects and other um, development projects. And um, yeah, talking about mobilizing some of the federal funding in the Inf Inflation Reduction Act related to trees and potentially having some tree steward, you know, hiring tree stewards instead of relying just on volunteers. So there was more in there. There was also some talk about uh, missing elements related to wetland preservation and thinking about some water quality impacts from, from uh, you know, fertilizers, uh, a whole bunch of other kind of soil toxic related actions that just weren't included. Thanks, Cameron. Any questions for his group and the ecosystems and sequestration focus area? Okay, so now turning it over to you, SUNY, and community resilience and preparedness focus area recap. Yeah, so our group talked also a lot about we were a small group of three, so uh, we talked a lot about um, retaining and replanting trees and how do we do that as development is happening. Uh, also talked about um, how to partner with community, like neighborhood groups and, um, and just neighbors knowing each other uh, to support folks during the emergencies. Um, how do we get people to the places that they need to be if, if there's a heat um, event or you know having the resources. Uh, folks who are low income don't have as much um, access uh, or maybe the um, ability to make changes in their homes. Uh, so in all of the areas kind of thinking about how do these different strategies work together and that it's not just one, um, one priority that would fit for every community. So a lot of discussion around kind of how all those things work, but definitely uh, some, you know, kind of trying to balance where, how do we save trees and, and, and have that for all communities and then also reduce um, reliance on transportation. So thanks so much, Suni. Any questions for that group before we move into the final focus area, which is buildings and energy? Okay. So my group also had a lot of really great input related to buildings and energy. And so some of the key focus areas or discussion summary points were the importance of making electrification affordable for all. So lots of affordability concerns around electrification and that was highlighted really across the board in various discussions around the actions. Also similar to some of the other conversations, the Shoreline Public Schools were identified as a key partner. They own a lot of buildings and so as it relates to buildings and energy, uh, that they would play a really critical role in a potential partnership. The group spent a lot of time talking about the role of solar and green roofs as well, and, and really the importance there of, of, you know, really requiring some of these things uh, versus having it be voluntary, uh, and especially as it relates to that affordability piece and renters, people that are not able to, are not owning homes, so enabling them also to have access to electrification, and whether it's plug-in stations, whether it's, uh, you know, solar, any of those, those efficiency upgrades. And then importance of maintaining existing tree cover and the, the critical role that tree canopies play in carbon sequestration and energy efficiency and, and all of those things uh, also related to buildings and energy. We also talked about the importance of environmental education. We, the group shared some concerns with kind of long-term implications of electrification. And right now we rely heavily on hydro 
and but also acknowledging and recognizing that electrification right now uh, we don't have uh, enough opportunities for electrification and as that becomes more and more the norm is is required in certain places how are we going to meet that demand and how are we going to meet that demand in the long term so those are the main elements of what the building and energy group talked about and so just wanting to thank across the board these great breakout room discussions and providing really great input both on the cap as as well and that overview as well as really diving into these actions and helping us put legs on this plan. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Cameron, who's going to share some, some key updates uh, about both the how to make comments on that CAP plan. We'll put the link back in the chat as to where that lives, and he's going to do a quick walkthrough. Cameron? Awesome. Thanks so much, Gretchen. And thank you all for yeah, sticking it out through the a long breakout session and a long event. Um, Haley, are you able to reshare the, the slides here? Yeah, give me one second. Sure. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, we, we have published the draft online. Um, uh, and here's the link here, or do you want, can we go back one slide actually? Is this the right slide for you, Conveo? Oh, sure. Okay. We, yeah, we start here. Um, yeah, so we published it online, and it's this platform called Conveo, where you can read through the document and just click anywhere on the page and put a comment. So um, I will share my screen really briefly to show you what it looks like when you log in. Are you all seeing that okay? Yes, we can see it, Cameron. Okay, thanks. So there's some intro text, and then if you scroll down, um, you can see here's the box um, with the cap, um, and there you can take a guided tour, um, and you can click through the pages here or just scroll. Um, you can hyperlink to the different sections that you wanna zoom in on. So I'll just go over here, transportation and mobility. If I click anywhere, um, you can just punch in a comment um, and it asks for your name and email, add your comment, and then uh, a form to say you're not a robot there. So that's what that looks like. And I will stop share and let you reshare, Haley. Um, so please, this will be open through October 10th. So please, if you have some time over the next two weeks, go in, take a look around uh, and leave any comments um, on the sections that you're interested in. Next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, we will have, just looking at the timeline, we will uh, keep the conveyo up until October 10th. And that is also the date that the draft, um, this draft will be presented to the city council. Um, so you're also able to submit comments, you know, at council meetings um, as is normal. Um, but uh, that's the when we'll be closing uh, the public comment for this draft. And then we will work with um, our staff and folks here at Cascadia to uh, incorporate any final changes or revisions based on uh, your feedback and the council's feedback, um, and then present that to the final version to the council on November 21st for adoption. And uh, we have the pro uh, the project webpage there. So if you wanna get emails um, about this project when we have updates, feel free to go to that page and sign up for emails there. Next slide, please. Can uh, go to the next slide, please. Okay, and before we leave, we do want to, um, we will be launching a uh, anonymous demographic poll. So this just helps us gauge, you know, how well our different outreach efforts are serving the shoreline community. 
Um, so it is anonymous. Uh, you don't have to take it if you're not comfortable doing so, um, but it is just uh, intended to help us um, know how we're doing in terms of serving uh, serving Shoreline. So I do ask if, if you're inclined to please take that uh, before you hop out of the Zoom here tonight. And that should have just popped up. So um, yeah, thanks, thanks for doing that. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, and you can reach me via email here at any time um, if you have additional questions or comments about the Climate Action Plan. Um, feel free to do that, and we'll we'll send out some links as well after the event. Next slide, please. Hold on one second, Cameron. Um, Heidi, I think you're on. Um, I think you need to go into the the Spanish channel for your interpretations. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Should I back up a little bit? Yeah, go ahead and go, I think maybe like the last slide or so. Okay. I was just saying, um, you can reach me via email here at any time with additional comments about the Climate Action Plan or questions. Next slide. Uh, and lastly, just a huge thank you, um, you know, just recognizing that you all have given up your time and energy for this process. Many of you, you know, multiple hours uh, over the past year, um, and in addition to tonight, sticking through a, a long online meeting. So um, <laughs> this is a big issue and it really does, it really will take all of us. So I just want to honor your participation, your feedback, um, your time that you've given so far. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, and that's uh, that's all I have. So please, um, we'll be signing off here at eight, but please, if you're able to fill out that uh, demographic survey, please do so.